Hi there everybody, my name is Ollie. I'm a junior doctor living and working in England. And welcome back to my series on medical emergencies for medical school and PA school final exams. Today we're going to be talking about acute upper gastrointestinal bleeds, and this one is actually the first ever proper emergency that I had to deal with as a junior doctor on my second ever day of work. I was by myself the only doctor on an unfamiliar ward, so it's something that I've since done a lot of reading and thinking about. But before we move on, just a reminder that if you've enjoyed this video, if you go ahead and fill out the feedback form in the description below at the end, that'll take you through to a folder where you can access a summary sheet for everything that we cover in this tutorial, as well as an Anki deck which you can add to your own study resources. And secondly, just a disclaimer that this is obviously not a substitute for proper clinical experience knowledge or training. It's intended purely as an educational resource to help students through their final exams. But with that out of the way, let's move on. So GI bleeds actually don't fit the typical structure that we use for these videos very well, because there are only really two obvious signs that you'll see that will make you think GI bleed. Most commonly, at least in my experience, this has been melina, dark, tarry, black-looking stools associated with digested haemoglobin that's passed all the way through the digestive tract, as well as haematemesis, that is, the obvious vomiting of blood. And that might be in small or large amounts too. The person might be retching up small amounts of blood into a sick bowl in the bed, or they might be hosing the wall <laughs> with, a, with a projectile stream of blood. And all of this raises some obvious questions. Why might this happen? This is obviously very much not normal. What might actually predispose someone to an upper gastrointestinal bleed? Well, while there are many important differential diagnoses, I think there are two that are really important to know for finals. The first of which is peptic ulcers, which are classically linked to chronic use of NSAIDs without appropriate gastric protection. So things like ibuprofen and naproxen, as well as infection with Helicobacter pylori. And these ulcers are essentially a sore that develops in the mucosa of either the stomach or the first part of the duodenum. And as these progress, they can actually erode through blood vessels, which causes really significant bleeding into the GI tract. And especially a really important one to know for finals is that duodenal ulcers can lie over the gastroduodenal artery. And the second major cause of upper GI bleeding to know about is esophageal varices. These are enlarged submucosal veins that sit within the final one-third of the esophagus. And these most commonly appear in response to portal hypertension, which itself arises usually from chronic liver disease such as cirrhosis, or something like chronic right-sided heart failure. When the back pressure in these systems becomes too much, they simply rupture and start releasing huge amounts of blood. So how are we actually going to manage our upper GI bleed in the acute setting? Thankfully, the main focuses are really simple, which is first, stop the bleeding, and secondly, replace losses and try and restore volume in our patient. Let's take a look at an exam scenario and work through it together. You are a Foundation Year 1 doctor who has just arrived at work on the hepatobiliary surgery ward. The charge nurse appears and asks you to hurry and see one of the patients, Mr. Sorinola. Mr. Sorinola is admitted for management of his ascites secondary to severe cirrhosis and is awaiting an acidic drain procedure. The nurse tells you that he has just vomited 1.5 litres of fresh blood into a vomit bowl and is continuing to retch. So we'll go and see Mr. Sorinola very quickly and examine him using an A to E approach. The airway is patent, the patient is able to speak to us in between retches. Moving on to B for breathing, his respiratory rate is 24 with O2 saturations of 98% on air, symmetrical chest expansion with good inspiratory effort. Moving on to circulation, his blood pressure is 88 systolic of 58 diastolic, heart rate is 120, his pulse feels weak and regular, and his heart sounds are normal. Moving on to D, his temperature is 37.4, pupils equal and responsive to light, and the most recent blood glucose measurement was 7.8 millimoles per litre. And finally, on to our complete exposure, there is a vomit bowl full of bright red blood in Mr. Sorinola's hands, and he looks quite pale. So what we have here, in summary, is a man who is vomiting large amounts of fresh blood, and is hemodynamically unstable, which we know from his systolic blood pressure of less than 90, and his tachycardia, suggesting that he's shocked. So what are we going to do? 
let's get started. It makes sense to call for help really early on in this scenario. Specifically, one of the things we need to do is activate the massive hemorrhage protocol, and your local trust will have its own guidelines on exactly what this involves and what you will get. Now, as to the question as to when exactly you'd be justified in activating the protocol, the JPAC, which is one of the advisory committees for blood transfusion, suggests that a pragmatic definition of when you'd want to activate the MHP may include the loss of 70 milligrams per kilo of blood in 24 hours, 50% of their total circulating volume in less than three hours, or indeed a systolic blood pressure of less than 90 or a heart rate of 110 or more. So there's a flexible range of definitions we might use. We'll cover it in more detail in another video, but for the sake of this video, this is going to alert the lab, get us enough blood product to start transfusing our patient now. And typically that will be four units of red cells and two of fresh frozen plasma. And on top of that, of course, let's make sure that someone calls our registrar and appropriate support, whether that might be the gastroenterologist, the surgeon, or anaesthetics depending on what you think is needed. But the first thing we need to do is transfuse because resuscitation is the name of the game. We need to support their existing circulation so getting two wide bore cannulae in, one in each arm at a minimum, is really important. And to illustrate the difference that the gauge of a cannula can make, pushing a litre of fluid through a blue cannula, a 22 gauge cannula, takes 22 minutes. If instead we were to choose a grey cannula we could put that same litre through in just 6 minutes. And you can actually push a litre through an orange, a 14 gauge cannula, in just three and a half minutes. So it really does make a practicable difference. A really urgent set of blood markers needs to be taken so we know what to give, including a full blood count, group and save, cross match, coagulation screen, and so on. Cross matched and group appropriate blood is the best thing we can give by definition, but obviously we have O negative available in emergencies. So now let's think about some more definitive management. What are we actually going to do about the bleeding site? The answer is usually going to lie with endoscopy. And this means calling the on-call endoscopist, who is usually going to be either a gastroenterologist, one of the medics, or a GI surgeon. And they may ask for something called the Glasgow Blatchford score. Now this is a risk stratification tool for people with an upper GI bleed, and it helps decide whether or not they're likely to need an intervention. I'll put the checklist on screen now so you can see it, but the long and short of it is that any score above zero suggests that your patient will likely need an endoscopy. And the reason that we're doing this endoscopy is ultimately to decide whether or not the bleeding is variceal, that is coming from ruptured esophageal varices. Once they've had this endoscopy, you may decide to calculate the Rockall score, which calculates two things. It calculates the likelihood of mortality for this patient, as well as the likelihood of a re-bleed. So to start with, if we assume that this bleeding was non-variceal, was perhaps coming from a pseudoaneurysm or a peptic ulcer, the bulk of the treatments are actually done during the endoscopy. There are a few things that can be done, including the endoscopist may decide to coagulate the area using heat, they might use surgical clips, or they might inject medicines such as adrenaline into the bleeding site to cause massive vasoconstriction and shut that blood flow off. And once that bleeding has been stopped, your patient should be given a proton pump inhibitor such as a meprazole or lanzoprazole to protect the stomach lining and promote recovery. But in our patient, in Mr. Soranola, the endoscopist finds that this is actually ruptured esophageal varices, which have formed secondary to this long-standing cirrhosis. Now, if you suspect that your patient has ruptured varices, like we could in this case, NICE recommends giving terlipressin immediately on suspicion to constrict the smooth muscle in those vessels and stop blood flow, as well as prophylactic antibiotics, as per your trust guidelines. Esophageal varices are usually managed by a process called band ligation, in which a tiny rubber band is placed around the neck of the bleeding vessel to stop the blood flow, and thus stems the bleeding. If this doesn't work, then usually the second line is going to be a treatment called a TIPS, or a transjugular intrahepatic portosystemic shunt. And as you might be able to decipher from the name, what this involves is diverting blood from the portal vein straight to the hepatic vein, which allows us to completely bypass the liver. That then reduces any buildup of pressure in the portal system and is going to bring down those varices and help them to stop bleeding. And then the final and slightly rogue option to be aware of is balloon tamponade. And the device that's used for this is called a Sengstack and Blakemore tube. And this is a tube that is inserted via the nose or mouth, which contains a balloon that is passed all the way down into the stomach. And one balloon inflates inside the stomach and another inside the esophagus. And what this does is it puts pressure on the gastroesophageal junction 
and simply shuts off, it tamponades the blood flow to those varices. I've never seen these used in practice, but they are there, and some people have used them in cases of emergency. And after all of this, after our patient is acutely managed and sufficiently transfused, our patient needs a really thorough medication review that includes any anticoagulants such as DOAX, warfarin, antiplatelets, things like aspirin, ticagrelor. We need a really careful look at what they're taking. Protection, as I said, with a PPI and appropriate safety netting advice, as well as appropriate referrals to specialists such as coagulation clinics so we can come up with a future plan and make sure this doesn't happen again. So thank you very much for watching guys, that brings us to the end of this video on acute GI bleeds. I hope you found it useful and very best of luck with your exams and your interviews. As I've said before, there's a summary sheet for everything in this video accessible via the feedback form in the description below. I'd really appreciate you filling that out if you have the time or the inclination. And be sure to go and check out my website ollieburton.com where you can find all of the videos in this series, my blog of life as a junior doctor, and much more besides. Take care, and I'll see you in the next video.